and welcome to the Epi Current. My name is Samantha Gilman, and this is the first episode of 2024. As we look forward to the new year, I'd like to actually take a moment and look back at the inaugural year of the Epi Current. I've got a few stats here that I'd like to share with our listeners. In 2023, we had 19 episodes, 32 guests from more than four organizations. We had more than 5,000 downloads from more than 50 countries. That is incredible. And thank you so much to our listeners for supporting us and listening to all of our experts here at EPRI and the organizations that we work with. Before we get started with our 2024 lineup, I'd like to share with our listeners some of the best hits from 2023. On this episode, you'll hear segments from a number of our episodes from last year. In case you might have missed an episode or a couple episodes, you can get right caught up listening to this episode. And with that, here we go. Here's the best of 2023 on the EPRI Current. We really look forward to sharing EPRI's latest research, insights from industry experts, and who knows what else. I really love to think about EPRI as a lever and not just any lever. It's like this giant catapult. Evolution can happen on its own, but transformation needs mass collaboration. And that's what EPRI can do. We make those connections through our massive networks of scientists and academics and engineers. And how can we solve the problems of today while keeping an eye on the future? And so we've gone from helping more than 400 nuclear plants in 30 countries to cleaning up coal emissions, but not just doing the reductions in waste, but also looking at repurposing them as well. So we've enabled transformation for decades and just wait and see to what comes next. What is the difference between fusion and fission? So at its base, fusion is what powers the sun. And unfortunately, we cannot bring the sun down to Earth. So we have to kind of recreate it. So in, in the sun, there's these huge gravitational forces that pull together lighter atoms. And as they are pushed together through gravitational force, they fuse, they combine. And when they combine, they form an atom that's actually lighter than the sum of the two atoms that you began with. And Einstein's, Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, dictates that if you lose mass when you combine atoms, there's a release of energy. So that's fusion. Two atoms coming together, combining, lose some mass, and energy is released. And as I said before, this is not something we can easily replicate down on Earth. But it is something that we are looking towards as a zero carbon dispatchable baseload form of, form of energy down here on Earth. So we have to be a little creative. We can't replicate gravity, but we can use things like really strong magnets, electric currents, lasers, other compression forces to kind of replicate what's going on in the sun and bring fusion down, down to Earth. Uh, folks like to say uh, fusion on Earth is like putting the sun in the bottle. So as you can imagine, it's a really big engineering challenge that that lots of very intelligent and smart folks are trying to, to drive towards today. And something else, Erica, you and I were just discussing before uh, we pressed record uh, was some of the robotics that we do there. So you were just talking about drones and uh, I just want to just briefly, can you tell us a little bit about Spot? Yes. So Spot is our robot. Right now we have them in our Charlotte campus doing some autonomous testing. The next stage of this is that spot is actually going to go up to our 138. It's a 138 KV working substation. It's a research substation. And I love Lennox because it gives us this ability to test out technologies that really de-risks it because it is not a substation that somebody is utilizing every single day to give somebody reliable power. So we're able to test out many different scenarios. And in this we're sending Spot up there and he's going to do fully autonomous inspections of that substation. So whether it is rainy, whether it is night, whether it is day, be able to take images of the assets up there from the ground. He's able to kind of pivot, take higher up images, take images from a physical security standpoint of what do those gates look like? Is there a fence that's been broken into? Is there a hole below the fence? All those type of different types of things that you might and could encounter in an actual substation 
were able to put spot through its paces there in our 138 kb yard in Lenox. It's really exciting. And I was excited. I was actually out with spot earlier today with Sonny, who leads our research here. And uh, it was fun just to watch spot going around and doing it fully autonomous. It was a lot of fun. Energy storage is an enabler. Um, you simply cannot achieve a low carbon future without energy storage. Energy storage allows the growth of, of wind and solar, which are intermittent. So the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. And energy storage is a way to, to store wind and solar when you have an excess amount so you can use it when you need it. So that the proverbial phrase is when you flip a light switch, the lights always come on. You want to have a reliable grid that we've had for, for decades, largely because of thermal power in the form of fossil always being available. Energy storage is, is designed to fulfill that role that, that thermal power did in the past. So it, its goal is to allow us to move towards a low carbon future and provide a reliable uh, grid that will work as, as we're used to over the last uh, 100 years. Climate change plays a big role in how we're thinking about resource adequacy now. There are many questions that feed into it. There's the question of extreme events, uh, extreme cold events, and extreme heat events. There's also the question of droughts. Uh, water is essential to power generation in many parts of the world. Um, the kind of obvious uh, thought related to water is hydroelectric generation. So hydro dams and uh, runoff river uh, generation. Uh, if there's droughts, we can get less power out of um, that type of generator. But there's also power plants that rely on water for cooling and that cannot work without that cooling water availability, like nuclear plants, for example. So a lack of water uh, can actually also lead to a lack of generation from certain um, from certain power plants that are not hydropower plants. So there's there are very significant impacts uh, of climate change on generation availability. And on demand, of course, there's the the side of if there's an extreme heat event or an extreme cold event, the customer is going to need more electricity to, to heat or to cool their homes. Climate Ready, which stands for Resilience and Adaptation Initiative, was launched because we really saw a need to better understand how to assess vulnerability across the power system when we think about both extreme weather and the way that the climate is changing over the long term. And so we saw that there was this need for a consistent approach for power companies and their stakeholders to take in order to do this type of assessment and then use that to inform the decisions that they're going to make about investments to enhance resilience. This research on grid resilience isn't new to EPRI, right? EPRI has been around for 50 years. We've been doing this research for over a decade. So we had a strong technical foundation to build upon, which is fantastic. Further, we were getting questions from members, right? This is where this comes from, is we were getting more and more questions from power companies saying, hey, we're having these, these extreme weather events and we know we need to plan for them. We know we need to understand our system better. We're getting questions from our own stakeholders. What are the resources that are out there? We're getting more capable in terms of the science behind these climate projections and the way that we can understand local climate hazards, right? There are regional questions here, and some of these impacts are hyper-local in the way that we need to think about them. And more than ever before, we can actually understand that because of advancements in this modeling and, and the way that we can downscale and, and localize data. So we were getting a lot of questions, and that's why we knew that, you know, we can take this work further. We can create this initiative that will build upon the foundation of work we have, but accelerate it by coming together and bringing together a large collaborative. Circularity is, is kind of a fancy name for a lot of concepts that really underlie the way that many industries, including um, electric power companies, um, operate. The idea here is it's circular in contrast to a more linear make, take, and dispose model. So instead of taking materials from the earth, refining them, processing, manufacturing things, using them, and then discarding them as waste, circularity certainly employs the concepts of reducing those materials, 
reusing them if possible, and certainly recycling them instead of simply disposing when they're done. So in this way, the economic output and the value of those products become higher because it's disconnected from that original material reuse. But those three R's, while they're the kind of fundamental basis of circularity, those three R's that you learned in elementary school, these days we talk about eight, nine, or even 10 R's. They include things like repair, refurbishing, and repurposing in addition to reducing, reusing, and recycling. So we're seeing, I mean, there are uh, unique challenges and opportunities with both offshore and uh, onshore um, wind energy. Is that correct? I mean, can you talk, go into a little more detail, maybe maybe first about what some of the, the, the those challenges and opportunities are with uh, the marine-based uh, technology? It's a good question, Bill. So there's a number of unique places where offshore wind will make sense. Um, and this has to do where you have large load centers or, or dense populations uh, relatively close to the coast. Uh, and they also have land constrained areas where they're unable to deploy solar or traditional onshore wind assets to meet their renewable energy portfolio targets. So you're seeing states lend to, to going offshore and, and procuring, um, looking to procure uh, energy from offshore wind assets. And so there's a number of things that are that are in play there. You have the offshore wind permitting issues where you traverse state and federal waters. Uh, you have environmental impacts to be concerned with. You have dual use with fisheries. Uh, you have marine mammals. You also have uh, birds and bat interactions in the offshore environment, uh, as well as corrosive materials uh, or corrosive environment with the salt spray on, on you know, steel materials and composite materials that make up the wind farm. So you have a number of just natural challenges that are different than the onshore space, and they require uh, a unique set of, of technologies to, to overcome. And so as this, you know, offshore wind matures as an industry, we're tackling and, and overcoming those challenges as, as, as we can. So, so now just between us, what what do you really think about supply chain? <laughs> Just between us and all of our listeners. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there there are a lot of challenges right now. We are seeing this massive deployment of these technologies. There are some of those the geopolitical considerations that are um, definitely something that we need to pay attention to. And as a result, we are seeing some project delays and cost increases in the near term as we're sorting through some of those challenges. But overall, I'm I'm optimistic that we can really kind of address these challenges. And maybe it's because I'm just optimistic in general, or maybe it's because I work with a lot of really smart people who just know how to address technology challenges. But, you know, I think between technology innovation and working on some of these lifetime and efficiency challenges and the proactive research that we're doing around codes and standards and new materials and new manufacturing methods. I just, I think we've got the right people that are looking at these challenges, both within EPRI and more industry wide and that, that we're going to, that we're going to be able to, to find solutions to meeting some of these challenges and continue on this uh, pathway towards economy-wide deep decarbonization and this clean energy transition that, that we're in the middle of right now. And to the point of EPRI and NEI working together, earlier I mentioned that the two organizations recently released a roadmap for the future at advanced nuclear reactors. Craig, can you tell us a bit about the roadmap and the goals for this? So a couple of years ago, we realized well, we've got to have a, a, a common song sheet, so to speak, to be singing from here. We need to identify what all the opportunities are, where the needs are, what what actions industry needs to take. We need to get all of those in one document um, so it's very clear who's doing what, who should own what, but then also use that as a way to rally the industry together. So instead of thinking about one project, this is about rallying the industry together kind of for the future of the industry. Um, and so that's what we've done in this document is it outlines, you know, key enablers, um, which Mark can talk more about that, you know, that we need to have in order to be successful. Then it outlines 46 key actions we need to take as an industry to be successful. But then we've also formed 
you know, something that we co- call a roadmap implementation board. So we formed a, a governing body made up of executives from the industry to oversee this. So we're really treating this uh, roadmap as, uh, you know, really, you know, less than a document and more like an initiative that the industry is going to run with for the next future to use it really as kind of like our guiding uh, tool to get us across the finish line. So, Dan, you've been involved with innovation for quite a period, some time. Where do you see innovation heading, uh, at least in the inter- energy industry? Yeah, there, there's a lot of different flavors of innovation, I'll say. And it's it's a broad term, right? But it can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. And I think a lot of that's what we see from a trend standpoint. So uh, often when uh, the industry is experiencing periods of, uh, of financial uncertainty uh, or maybe pressured from a cost standpoint, then the type of innovation that tends to get focused on is continuous improvement, uh, incremental innovation, it's sometimes ca- called. But it really focuses on what are near-term savings, efficiencies, or performance improvements that can be driven from within the organization. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, I recall a lot more of the focus was on more transformational innovation because there's a lot of conversation around would the utility business model uh, be changed significantly? Would technology uh, come into the equation that would really change the prospects uh, for the industry? And so in those timeframes, a lot more focus was on transformational uh, innovation. How do you create new businesses or new product lines or new services for the organization. I think it's always challenging to predict where it might head in the future, but I think uh, there's definitely a trend towards more incremental innovation as a focus. Uh, Utilities are pressured from an inflation and cost standpoint, and obviously there's economic headwinds that they're facing that will likely cause them to really focus on their incremental innovation. But one area that uh, transformative innovation is really occurring is uh, from a technology standpoint, particularly on new uh, generation technologies and things like battery storage. Uh, You see a lot of public funds uh, flowing into these areas. And that's really exciting because it's a resource that can be used to improve and mature technologies that utilities uh, will ultimately be the buyers and owners of. Uh, so I think you'll see a much quicker pace of innovation from a technology standpoint, particularly around generation and storage uh, in the coming years because of uh, those investments and what's happening uh, within those sectors. Well, that was great. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I know we covered a lot of topics in 2023, and we're going to be covering even more in 24. We've got a great lineup for you for 2024. We have a number of episodes already scheduled and being recorded. Um, We will be talking about everything from nuclear innovation to electric vehicles to extreme weather to who knows what, who knows where the year will take us. So we hope that you'll follow along and continue to listen as we bring a new episode to you every other week. I hope you'll join us in two weeks for our first official episode of 2024. And until then, this is your host, Samantha Gilman, signing off. If you like today's show, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and feel free to share the podcast with your colleagues and friends. For more information about EPRI, please visit our website at www.epri.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at EPRI News. Together, we are shaping the future of energy.